Uh, welcome to the No-Till Training Program's eight-part webinar series. This training has been developed through a collaboration between the University of Vermont, University of Maine, and USDA NRCS. All associated work and materials are supported by the Northeast Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education Program under subaward ENE 18-149. Today's webinar is going to focus on herbicide and pest management with presentations by Bill Curran and John Tucker. We'll begin with a presentation by Dr. Bill Curran. Dr. Curran is a professor in the Department of Plant Science and has been a member of the Penn State faculty since 1990. Bill had an extension research split and state and statewide responsibilities for weed management education in agronomic crops. Bill's extension program focused on providing his ag constituents with the latest weed management information, and his extension program was very much tied to his applied research program. He regularly developed outreach information that included annual production of the Mid-Atlantic Weed Management Guide, targeted fact sheets on weed problems, and timely newsletter articles. Dr. Curran conducted research on weed biology and ecology, integrated weed management, weed management and conservation tillage systems, including managing cover crops and opportunities for managing weeds in organic crop production systems. So Dr. Curran, if you could please share your screen, we can begin your presentation. All right. uh, good morning for you folks that are out there. Um, so I'm going to cover uh, the weed side uh, this morning, and uh, I, I titled it Managing Weeds with Less Tillage. Um, coming from Pennsylvania, certainly uh, no-till is, is very popular, um, uh, probably somewhere between 60 and 70 percent uh, of our acres are managed with no-till, but I would say most of that is not continuous no-till, and, and um, I think some of the comments I'm going to make this morning relate to the, um, the benefit of having some occasional tillage in there. And I think most of you are from, from New England uh, where there historically has been a lot of tillage. And so uh, hopefully some of this will be, will be relevant. Um, so this is sort of the outline of, of what I'm gonna go through this morning. Um, can't get away without talking about integrated weed management. And there's a number of things there. I'll, and I'll be brief about that. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about cover crops. I've been very involved in uh, cover crop research um, over the last 15 or so years, um, and it's a pretty can be a pretty powerful uh, cultural weed control tactic. Uh, and then also some things related to cover crops uh, uh, when you're establishing them, some herbicide considerations, and then also when you're terminating them uh, in a no-till system. And, and hopefully we'll have some time at the end for some discussion. Uh, there still are a number of challenges um, in no-till uh, related to weeds. Um, we have a lot of problems uh, in the mid-Atlantic with herbicide resistance. Uh, I would say that's true across uh, uh, the Corn Belt and, and into the south. Uh, I think in New England um, and New York, I'll have to add New York in there, um, it, it's coming your way is what I would say. Um, you, it, and I would have said the same thing for Pennsylvania. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, where we, we had historically um, a number of resistant issues, but uh, nothing that we really couldn't manage. And, and now we have um, some problems that are really sort of dictating how farmers are, are thinking about management. And then certainly certain perennials can still be uh, a problem in no-till. When we reduce tillage, perennials become more of an issue. Uh, we ha I think if, if you're familiar with herbicides, uh, you know that there haven't been any new herbicide modes of action. Uh, introduced really in the last 20 years. Um, and so in no-till, uh, thinking about how to not overuse uh, Roundup glyphosate and, and Roundup Ready uh, is a challenge. Identifying long-term continuous no-till systems that are sustainable, I think that still is really a really strong goal. Uh, and then really uh, trying to think about some of the new technologies that are coming along, uh, whether it be uh, you know precision ag sorts of things, uh, some of the uh, genetic uh, manipulation technologies that uh, have come into play, uh, how these can, can be introduced uh, to maybe improve uh, no-till systems. So um, I think we're making progress, but we, we still have a ways to go. 
So this is sort of the, the classical integrated, integrated weed management uh, slide uh, that includes things like prevention, uh, we, which weed ID and, and scouting is a big part of, uh, cultural controls, and I've just sort of cherry picked some that I'm gonna focus on today. Uh, mechanical control, um, which becomes more limited uh, in no-till systems. Uh, herbicides, chemical control becomes a, a, a big piece, uh, managing herbicides, rotating herbicides, thinking about resistance management, trying to reduce reliance. And then finally, a biological control, uh, which we, we wish we could talk more about. Uh, it's, it's not, hasn't been a major component of, uh, of weed management uh, in most systems, um, but there still is some things that are going on there. Uh, I mentioned the mechanical control piece. Um, you know, really, when you think about no-till, um, that's, that's the piece that, that disappears, uh, at least in terms of tillage. Um, well, board plowing, uh, conservation tillage, those sorts of things. Uh, when I go out and talk to folks in Pennsylvania, hardcore no-tillers, uh, you know, they're, they're just never going to use anything that disturbs the soil. Um, unless they really have to. And so, so it becomes challenging because that means that those other pieces uh, that go into the program become that much more important. And I think cultural control, uh, which includes a number of things uh, that I have listed at the top of this slide, um, you know, that this, these, these become much more important. And I, and I think the number one uh, cultural control uh, tactic is, is crop rotation diversity. Uh, and so to me, a sustainable no-till continuous no-till system in particular uh, requires really thinking about a, a diverse crop rotation um, because that, that's what's going to help uh, prevent certain species of weeds from becoming uh, problematic. So with diversified cropping systems, we have fewer weed problems. You know, when you, when you rotate crops, uh, more crops, uh, rotating summer annuals with winter annuals, with perennials, uh, wide rows, narrow rows, uh, some, maybe some till um, mixed with no-till. Uh, you're using herbicides and you're, you're rotating herbicide modes of action and applying them at different times uh, and, and hopefully including other types of non-chemical uh, weed control, particularly when you introduce a, a perennial forage like alfalfa uh, or an alfalfa grass uh, and you introduce mowing uh, into, that <clears throat> into that system, that, that becomes a really powerful uh, weed control tool. So diversified cropping systems really are, are the key uh, to sustainable uh, continuous no-till. And these are just, this is just one example. Um, I think, and, and I think this makes, makes really good sense, rotating away from, from crops uh, that are temperature and life cycle related. And so I have some examples here. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're just growing corn continuously, obviously you're gonna uh, select for, for weeds that do well in corn. Uh, but if we can rotate that corn with, with uh, uh, winter annuals like wheat uh, or rye or barley, or we have uh, alfalfa or orchard grass, something like that in there, uh, we introduce a, a, a very powerful tool that uh, eliminates, really eliminates those weeds that be, become problematic in corn. Cover crops uh, are another part of, of uh, rotation diversity uh, and really an opportunity to, to introduce something into the system. Um, oftentimes these are winter annuals. Uh, we're trying to cover the, uh, the soil over the winter, but it, it really uh, uh, can bring a, more into the system and, and sort of automatically becomes uh, uh, a rotation diversity tool. And I'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. I mentioned mechanical control on the first slide. And, and again, this uh, has its limitations uh, in, in no-till systems. Um, uh, as I, as I mentioned already a couple of times though, uh, incorporating perennial forages that allow mowing can become very important. Uh, and then I've spent some time trying to think about shallow uh, tillage tools. Uh, are there tools that, you know, not inversion tillage, not a mobile board plow that uh, can add to a system. And uh, uh, what I think about also is the idea of maybe selectively time tillage where where um, we maybe aren't, we aren't tilling every year, but maybe we're tilling it uh, every three or four years, um, and then we're covering the soil at the same time. So maybe we're, we're, we're plowing, uh, and then we're planting the cover crop, for example, uh, going into the winter. Um, I had a student, um, oh, it's probably been six or seven years ago now, uh, and we spent quite a bit of time trying to look at um, uh, 
less disturbance type tools, vertical tillage type tools. Uh, we looked at a high residue rear rehoe. Uh, I've done a lot of work with uh, high residue cultivation. Uh, and it, it's challenging to find things that really um, are as powerful as the kind of tillage tools that we're used to. Um, in the end, uh, that, that high residue cultivator uh, in the lower left, um, we continue to, to do research on that. I can't say that there's a lot of adoption, uh, but it actually is a pretty effective tool. Um, and we've, had, we've incorporated that into a number of different trials uh, over the years. Um, and something to think about um, if you're interested in reducing tillage and, and also, you know, using less disturbance. Most uh, no-tillers rely a lot on, on chemical weed control, and, it, and it's really difficult to, to get away from it. Um, there are some real practical benefits, uh, uh, as the first one says, facilitating no-till, uh, allowing earlier establishment, reducing time and energy. Um, the herbicides that we have in the marketplace today are, are really good, uh, really effective. Um, you know, I have it here as a, as a benefit, reduce the need for crop diversity rotation. Uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm pushing uh, rotation diversity today. Um, and so this has been one of the problems with herbicides is that they've allowed us to uh, sort of get lazy um, and, and we can get into, into problems with that. And then of course, also they're, they're pretty cost effective. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're using herbicides uh, and you use them right, uh, they're a really powerful tool. Uh, I'm focused on corn today. Um, I figured corn is sort of the universal crop that probably most of you are involved in. Uh, so I'll be sort of referencing that most of the time. And, and um, we have a lot of herbicides uh, available in corn. Over 100 products uh, are labeled uh, for corn. And I just sort of picked some of the more common things, uh, soil applied products, uh, and then some post-emergence materials. and. <laughs> And so it can be, if, if you're not in the herbicide world, it can be somewhat daunting trying to figure out what to use. Um, you know, I think number, number one, uh, when you're thinking about herbicides is you want to look at performance. Uh, what weeds do you have? Uh, and then how effective is that herbicide uh, on those particular weed species or herbicides on those particular weed species? Certainly crop safety uh, is important and, and most of the products in the marketplace are, are quite safe now. Uh, and, and then the third one is resistance management, which is becoming more and more important. And uh, I'm gonna talk, talk more about that, uh, really thinking about um, how you can rotate herbicides, how you can use different herbicides, um, even within a year or, or certainly across years. Some of the other things though, now most of our farmers are, are growing uh, transgenic crops, uh, Roundup Ready, Liberty Link, uh, things like that. And so oftentimes uh, when, when a farmer buys a, a a variety of corn, a hybrid of corn, you know, there may be a seed package, herbicide uh, package that goes along with that. Cost uh, is always important. Uh, environmental restrictions, uh, which we certainly need to, need to keep in mind. Uh, and then other things like convenience. Uh, sometimes folks buy things just on, on the packaging. Uh, it has a really good mixing quality. It doesn't stink. Uh, so those sorts of things. And then really, uh, once you get to know, uh, have a relationship with a dealer, or a distributor, uh, oftentimes that may dictate uh, what's being used on the farm. One of the biggest uh, negatives that's going certainly across the country now is this herbicide resistance crisis, uh, and that is what people are calling it. Um, I would say, I wouldn't say it's exploded, but in some areas of the U.S. it certainly has. Uh, the Mid-South, uh, Arkansas, uh, Missouri, uh, some of those areas, uh, there's some, some real issues going on. Um, it's, it's crept up into the uh, mid-Atlantic. Uh, I would say it's worse in the southern part of the mid-Atlantic and um, I think it's just moving into New York, some of the problems that, um, that other areas of the country have faced. Um, and then multiple herbicide resistance where you have resist resistance to uh, more than one uh, mechanism of action of herbicides is really on the rise. And, and the weeds that are of, of uh, biggest concern tend to be, uh, you know, the pigweeds, um, mare's tail or horseweed, uh, we call it, um, the ragweeds, lamb's quarters, certainly some of the weeds that um, you all are, are dealing with. And if you're not familiar with uh, this website, uh, weedscience.org, it's a, it's a great website uh, where this, this gentleman, Ian Heap, sort of tracks uh, resistance uh, 
actually globally, uh, but it's, it's it's a great site to sort of stay up to date on on what's going on out there. Um, if you haven't seen this paper, and it's it's a little dated, 2012, uh, published by CAST, um, I thought it was really interesting, um, and it's a it's a it's a good read. Herbicide resistance, herbicide resistant weeds threaten soil conservation gains, uh, and it really discusses um, the the, the no-till uh, herbicide resistance, uh, I guess, uh, paradigm, and and. Uh, how we can deal with resistance without going back to, to full tillage. And, um, and it, it, it continues to, and I would say it, it's still an issue, it's still a, a very big, maybe a bigger issue. Um, the two weeds that we're dealing with most uh, in the mid-Atlantic and relative to, re to resistance uh, is horseweed or also called mare's tail. Um, that upper left-hand uh, picture is a, is a picture from Southeastern Pennsylvania that I took probably, um, at least 10 years ago, uh, maybe 12 years ago. Um, and it started down in the southeastern part of uh, the state and, and has now moved, uh, I would say, certainly, certainly as far west as Pittsburgh uh, and probably, um, you know, it's spotted in the northern part of the state. And I know it's moved into New York. Uh, there's problems there now. And then, then the one that's even more concerning is the lower one, uh, Palmer pigweed or Palmer amaranth. Uh, and that's a, a picture I took about five years ago, um, and it is uh, sort of rapidly spreading uh, in in different counties. and And the challenging thing with the with the pigweed is is that um, our farmers aren't managing their fields to select for the problem, uh, but we're importing it, and so it's coming in, or it came in uh, in in various commodities, uh, contaminated seed, hay. Um, you know, it's all, I would say it's hard to hard to pinpoint exactly how it's come in, but often associated with dairy farms. Uh, so our dairy farmers bringing in uh, different uh, forage and, and feed stock uh, that's contaminated with it. Um, Cause it's, it's quite common uh, uh, in the South, as I mentioned, the, the mid, the mid South, uh, actually up and up along the Atlantic coast, uh, the Carolinas have a lot of problem with it too. <clears throat> so something to, I guess, to prepare for, is what I'm telling you. And certainly there's some real costs associated with resistance, uh, fewer herbicide options. Um, you know, it's, it, the, the typical reaction is using more herbicide. Um, I would say that's almost always the reaction. So you're not, you're continuing to use probably what, uh, what you have been, but you're tank mixing uh, other products or you're making additional trips over the field with other materials, uh, certainly increasing costs, um, lack of control, uh, yield or quality loss, uh, those are certainly real possibilities. And I, I really love this cartoon, um, and I, I borrowed it from a, a colleague of mine, uh, actually from, from Montana State University, uh, and it's, it's two fish in a fish bowl. Uh, the first one says, I think we're lost, and uh, the other one says, maybe we should go back the, way, the other way. Uh, and and it really, I think it really points out that a herbicide problem doesn't always have a herbicide solution. So uh, when, you, when you have resistance, uh, it, it shouldn't be the, the first thought shouldn't be what other herbicide can I use to take care of this? It really should be thinking about uh, how do I uh, reduce these weed problems. So let's talk a little bit more about cover crops. Um, as I mentioned that we've been very involved uh, at Penn State uh, in cover crop research uh, really for at least 15 years. Um, this is a, a picture of a publication uh, that we published. I think this is probably 10 years old now. Uh, suppressing weeds using cover crops in Pennsylvania, and it sort of goes through how uh, how cover crops can help suppress weeds. And this is a, a diagram. Basically, uh, uh, the the donut is the the life cycle of an annual weed going from seedling, um, uh, basically, in through seed production. Uh, and cover crops can influence a lot of those processes uh, as that that weed is uh, is is trying to be successful. Um, cover crops can affect the, the, the microenvironment. Uh, they can help harbor uh, natural enemies. Uh, one of the things that we focused on probably most is, most is the orange triangle, uh, looking at how cover crops can physically suppress uh, weeds as a, as, a, as a dead mulch. Uh, but there's a number of other things that cover crops can do uh, to help, uh, I guess, ramp up your, your weed control program. And I really like this picture. It's a, a picture of uh, Harry Vetch. Um, and you can see a, a skip 
where it wasn't seeded and where there's no hairy vetch and, and what you see in there are a bunch of weeds, basically winter annual weeds, mustards. So this would have been somewhat sometime in early spring probably. I uh, see the leaves are just beginning to, to leaf out. Um, I mentioned that we've done quite a bit of work in this um, and, and looking at individual species, uh, mixtures, uh, planting dates, termination dates, you know, those sorts of things. And, and I think this slide does a really nice job. Uh, this is a study that we did a few years ago where we're looking at, at uh, monocultures and mixtures. Um, and what you see here are three different treatments, uh, oats alone at 120 pounds, oats plus radish, and then a rye, vetch, and radish mix. And, and this is a picture taken um, probably right before Thanksgiving. Uh, in 2014, we seeded these pretty early, and that's that tends to be a key. So they were seeded on September 5th. And what I want you to pay attention to here is is how much soil do you see there? And uh, and so when we add multiple species together, uh, and particularly when we plant early, a lot of times we can do a much better job at, at covering the soil. And there's a direct relationship to that and weed suppression. And uh, I, I work with a a guy named uh, John Wallace. He was a postdoc with me for um, four years, and now he actually has my job uh, at Penn State. Um, and he's he's a great guy, and he's really productive, and he's continuing some of the work that that I was involved in. And this is a figure from some work that we did together, uh, where we're looking at um, the, the first look at the bottom. It's ground cover. So this is this was a cover crop, like we just saw in the previous slide. Ground cover. Um, actually 10 weeks after planting. So this would have been that November timeline. And, and so as we increase ground cover, what we see on the, the y-axis or the vertical, vertical axis is population decrease, decrease at burn down. So coming into the spring, um, the more ground cover we had back in late fall, uh, the better we are at suppressing weeds. And this happens to be for, for mare's tail, a winter annual. Um, and so we get a pretty good indication that if we suppress uh, weeds in, in December, November, December, we're going to do a pretty good job uh, at taking care of those weeds a little bit later on. So, so uh, one, of the, one of the bigger challenges though is that's a winter annual or summer annuals and summer annual weeds tend to be more challenging to control with cover crops and, and there that's where we're really trying to maximize spring biomass or dry matter and in order to do that uh, we really need to think about establishment date and also termination dates and, and the, uh, the date at the bottom uh, this is a rye cover crop uh, where we did a study uh, in 2015 and you can see um, we terminated, terminated it on the 18th of May, got about 1,800 pounds of dry, dry matter. Uh, if we waited until, um, I see there's a mistake in that. If we, if we, we should have been seven days apart. But basically, the, later, the, the longer we delayed uh, termination, the more biomass we achieved. And so if we could wait and this example was the 21st of May, we're up to uh, about 5,400 pounds of dry matter. So uh, you really want to maximize biomass if you're going after uh, summer, annual, summer annual weeds. Uh, this is an example of that uh, where we had a rolled hairy vetch mulch uh, in organic corn, and it did a pretty nice job of suppressing weeds for, for five or six weeks, and now you can see some of those uh, annual grasses, foxtails that are starting to come in there. Um, I really like this slide and it goes back a ways, uh, 1993, uh, John Teasdale, uh, who was with uh, the USDA in Beltsville and, and Chuck Moeller, who is still at, at Cornell. And it looks at uh, in, the effect of increasing rye mulch uh, biomass on different weed species. And what we see is, is as we increase the, the amount of biomass, uh, we reduce the number of seedlings that can emerge through that. Uh, typically in, in Pennsylvania, uh, I like to see between five and 6,000 pounds uh, of dry matter. That sort of is the, I would say, sort of the threshold. Uh, as you go south, uh, uh, they need more than that because they have more weed problems. And I think as you go north, probably a little bit less uh, would, would be effective. So some of the take homes that I want you uh, to have today uh, for controlling annual weeds with, with cover crops, I think prioritizing uh, fall planting date, getting them established as soon as you can. Uh, think about maximizing growth, uh, including winter hardy species. You know, cereal rye is a good example. Um, one of the things that we saw is, is having sufficient soil fertility, and especially nitrogen, is really important to get a, a good competitive cover crop. So if you're going into a, a rotation 
where you don't have good fertility, um, say you're following corn, for example, and you've, you've used up much of that nitrogen, that can be a problem. Uh, for summer annuals, allow, allow spring biomass accumulation uh, before termination, and, and I would say something greater than 5,000 pounds of dry matter is, is typically uh, what we're, we're, we're looking for. Okay, the, the second thing I'm going to discuss with cover crops is uh, the impact of herbicides. Um, before you establish them, and most of uh, our farmers are using residual, residual herbicides, certainly in corn. Uh, and these can pose a bit of a problem uh, for some for some cover crops. And and the term that I'm going to throw out uh, today, and hopefully you're familiar with this, is is half life. Um, when the half life of the herbicide is is too short, uh, we don't get long enough weed control. But when it's too long, uh, it can persist and, and carry over and, and be a, be a problem. And this is a graph that sort of demonstrates that. And so the half life is the amount of time needed to degrade or dissipate half of the herbicide. Uh, and I have an example, uh, 2,4-D, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It, it has a short half-life, about seven days. So one half-life, uh, you end up with 50% less, two half-lives, 75% left, less, et cetera. Um, and so within a month, uh, after applying 2,4-D, it, it more or less is gone. Uh, and so there's no risk of, of having carryover injury. Uh, on the other hand, something like atrazine, uh, which has a, a half-life of about 60 days, uh, you can see that it's going to have to go through a number of half-lives before it gets to a point where there, there aren't residues uh, that could influence the establishment of certainly sensitive species. And so by knowing half-life, um, it can be, it can be a, uh, a good predictor of, uh, I guess, what you can get away with. And these are just some common herbicide half-lives. And you can see they range from as low as seven days uh, to uh, something maybe as much as 90 days, uh, depending on what herbicide uh, uh, you're, you're using. And there's a number of factors that, that influence this. Um, you know, is it a volatile herbicide? Uh, is it water soluble? Uh, does it degrade with sunlight? Uh, certainly most important is that, that lower right microbial degradation, really how quickly do uh, the microbes uh, break it down. Uh, and there's a number of things that influence that uh, and some differences. Uh, in uh, New York and, and New England, uh, there's some pretty heavy soils in, in some places, and, and that actually can hold on to herbicide longer. Uh, also, New York tends to have some high pH situations, and, and that can be a problem uh, that you need to think about. Uh, drought, uh, uh, they last longer. Uh, application rate, full versus reduced rates, pre versus post. Uh, tillage system, uh, no-till. Uh, Probably herbicides last a little bit more, a little bit longer in no-till systems because tillage can dilute uh, the herbicides. And then, really, if you're using combinations of products, which most people do, um, we can we need to think about both of those active ingredients uh, and what the half-life is. Uh, just some examples uh, for corn: some products that, uh, and these are sort of broad categories, things that last uh, four months or more. Uh, things that last two to four months and then things that don't last very long. And so you might sort of take a look at that and see what, what you recognize there. Uh, so there's two things that go along with this. I've been talking about the half-life, which is related to persistence. How long does it last in the soil? Uh, the other component of that is is um, how sensitive or susceptible is the cover crop that I'm interested in planting. And certain cover crops can be quite sensitive and others quite tolerant. And so, uh, if just as an example here, uh, some common herbicides, atrazine, uh, mesotrione, which is the active ingredient in a number of products now, uh, Callisto uh, might be the one that you've heard of. Um, and what you notice here is that things like alfalfa are, are really small seeded legumes. Alfalfas, clovers uh, are quite sensitive to a number of these products. Uh, radish, uh, mustard species tend to be pretty sensitive. Uh, things like cereal rye tend to be pretty tolerant, and so uh, we can get away with planting things like rye uh, or wheat or barley, uh, oftentimes where uh, small seeded broad leaves tend to be the most problematic. So where do you find this kind of information? And I'll put a plug in for um, um, a couple of publications that we produce at, at Penn State, the Agronomy Guide. Uh, John Tooker, uh, who you'll hear from shortly, uh, uh, just inform me that the new guide's coming out uh, in January. So there'll be a new agronomy guide. We also do a, a weed control guide or a weed management guide. Uh, 
And in fact, the information in the weed guide is the exact same that's in the agronomy guide. Um, and so as an example, uh, hopefully you can see this. This is a table um, from the current guide. Uh, there's a, a, a herbicide rotation restrictions uh, table. And I've highlighted a couple of things. Uh, clover and winter rye, those are the only two cover crops that we have listed in, in this table. This is really a, a crop rotation table, a, a, a cash crop rotation table. But you can see things like 2,4-D, uh, as I mentioned, short half-life, uh, very liberal rotation restrictions, not very many restrictions. But those other products I have listed there, things like Acuron, which contains mesotrione, uh, Atrazine, uh, Balance Flex, Corvus, Callisto, uh, pretty long rotation restrictions, uh, in some cases uh, as much as uh, 18 months. Uh, I mentioned this doesn't really include many cover crops, and so there is another table um, in these guides actually that uh, where you can look up some half-life information and also uh, some of the restrictions related specifically for, for cover crops. And so uh, this can be a, a pretty helpful tool if you're interested in, in persistence and, and uh, rotation. Just some general guidelines, um, you know, corn, focusing on corn herbicides, uh, atrazine, simazine, um, those are products to pay attention to. Mesotrione, uh, I've mentioned a couple of times now. Uh, the active ingredient imbalance or Corvus uh, can be a problem. And then uh, a product called clopyrrolid, which is now in a number of herbicides as well. So uh, there are some specific products that uh, you really sort of have to steer away from uh, if you're interested in, in certainly using legumes and, and uh, mustard sorts of things. Uh, mesotrione uh, has been in the marketplace for oh, 15 plus years now. Uh, and a lot of products that contain mesotrione. And so you kind of have to distill what, what is in these products, make sure you know what you're using or, or recommending um, because it can be a problem. Um, the other thing that comes into play with, with cover crops is, is also we need to know what to use to control them. Um, and so uh, uh, there's a number of, two, two parts of this really is the herbicide that you use and then and the timing that goes along with this. Um, and you want to make sure that you're using herbicides that are effective on both the cover crop and the weeds, because uh, it's, it's rare that you're just going to have uh, just a cover crop. You might have some, uh, in, in Pennsylvania, we often have uh, mare's tail, uh, glyphosate resistant mare's tail that's uh, uh, mixed in with that cover crop. So you want to make sure you're controlling that. Uh, think about residual herbicides. Uh, are you going to tank mix it or are you going to have to come back uh, with a second application? Uh, and then making sure that you're thinking about injury because there are some products that can, can be more problematic. Um, the list of burn down herbicides is, is pretty short. Um, and certainly glyphosate uh, is number one. Um, Paraquat is used by some folks uh, and that can be pretty effective. And oftentimes we're using uh, what I call PGRs, plant growth regulators, uh, in combination with, with um, one of these, these non-selective herbicides in order to control maybe resistant broadleaves that could be there. So there's another table for you um, uh, from our agronomy guide, and you can look up what's best on cereal rye, for example. But at the same time, you also need to know maybe what's, what's also gonna work on those weeds that are mixed in with that cereal rye. So making sure you're sort of looking at uh, both the cover crop uh, and the weeds uh, that, may be that may be present. I'm sure most of you are familiar with glyphosate, uh, been in the market for, for decades. Uh, I thought I'd just point out a, a couple of things. Uh, and probably the main thing I wanted to point out is that, that last uh, bullet point, that when we tank mix things with glyphosate, uh, we need to be pretty careful because there's some products that antagonize it. Uh, and so you really want to avoid um, clay-based herbicides, things that are uh, dry flowable, flowables, uh, also the what we call the photosynthesis inhibitors, things like atrazine. Uh, and then also you need to be careful about um, foliar, foliar or liquid uh, herbicides, or excuse me, fertilizers, because those can antagonize it. And uh, uh, I experienced this firsthand, um, this is uh, I think maybe three years ago, some trials that we had out uh, where we we're looking at weed control in, in cereal rye. And you can see uh, where I had glyphosate by itself. Uh, versus glyphosate mixed with uh, uh, the active ingredient metribuzin, which is a, a common soybean herbicide. Uh, and you can see how it, uh, same rate of glyphosate and how it antagonized it. Now, eventually that rye died, but it was much slower. And so again, making sure you recognize uh, 
uh, what you're using, what you're tank mixing, and whether it would have uh, uh, any sort of negative impact. I'm gonna see. I'm, I'm gonna finish up with with this. Uh, just a couple of notes about planting green. We have a number of farmers that are really interested in planting green, and that's where we plant the uh, the primary cash crop into an actively growing cover crop. Uh, most popular with large seeded cash crops like corn uh, or soybean or even things like like pumpkin. Uh, often multi-species mixtures, uh, certainly no-till, and we're using herbicides uh, for both cover crop and weed control. And so this is in contrast to where we would kill a cover crop uh, one to two weeks before we would plant our, our cash crop. And so this is gaining some, some ground uh, in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, So there you can see uh, planting green firsthand. One of the experiments that we had out a couple of years ago into cereal rye in this case. And there are certainly some potential benefits uh, that our farmers uh, uh, are, are looking for. Um, you can see them, see them listed here. Uh, but there also can be some disadvantages. Um, and so it's important to recognize uh, that, that you're gonna need to have the right equipment uh, and timing becomes, becomes very, uh, very important uh, and some of the dis disadvantages uh, listed here. So most of my uh, effort has been focused on, on herbicide selection uh, and application timing. Um, and so just some special considerations, uh, certainly making sure the seed is covered, really regardless of what herbicide. Uh, I did quite a bit of work with plant growth regulator herbicides, looking at injury potential. Uh, and there is some injury potential with that. And so um, if you're thinking about planting green or trying planting green, uh, really think about that, that herbicide piece uh, carefully. And that is the last uh, slide that I have. I, I am right at 35 minutes, Catherine. So hopefully uh, uh, didn't get us off track too much. Um, so everyone, please welcome Dr. John Tuker. Dr. Tuker is an Associate Professor of Insect Ecology and Extension Specialist in the Department of Entomology at the Pennsylvania State University, a position he's held for almost 11 years. He is originally from Connecticut and received his PhD in entomology from the University of Illinois at Urbana Campaign. His research group studies relationships among plants, invertebrate herbivores, and natural enemies to understand factors that regulate populations of herbivores, herbivorous insects and slugs. Um, so looks like your presentation is up, so you can start whenever you're ready. <clears throat> All right, Catherine, thank you very much. It's always good to, fill, uh, to follow uh, Bill Curran. Uh, Bill and I have worked together for a number of years now in no-till systems. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, insect and slug management in no-till systems. Um, oftentimes the insect um, management piece is not considered as heavily as the, uh, the weed management piece, and I understand that. Um, but I thought I would provide a little bit of insight on what we've been studying and some of the findings we found. Uh, a lot of my talk is going to focus on uh, what we call natural enemies. Uh, Bill mentioned natural enemies briefly. But one of those is um, featured on your screen here. This is a jumping spider um, in the genus Phytopus. And they are attractive little guys. Uh, if there are more of these in crop fields, then you'll have fewer insect pest problems. Uh, and note the, uh, the blue color of the fangs of that little jumping spider are not color enhanced. That's actually natural structural color. So they're kind of pretty to look at. Okay, so as Bill touched upon briefly, um, there are clear benefits to no-till. Um, no-till decreases the amount of times one must cross a field, and it helps conserve soil and water resources. Uh, and there are um, a lot of no-till fields in Pennsylvania. Um, again, as Bill said, maybe uh, 60 to 70 percent of our fields uh, tend to be managed uh, with no-till. So we have some experience with this down here. But farmers tend to believe that when you move to no-till, that insect pests become more problematic. So I've heard out on the extension trail that this is one of the 
um, one of the concerns that farmers have is that if I move to no-till, I'm going to have a bigger problem with insect pests because that tillage can directly disrupt uh, insect pest populations. Um, and when, as soon as you move away from that, then the populations are going to grow. Well, actually, this is a little bit of a misconception. Um, no-till does not make insect pest populations worse or, or more abundant, but it does shift them a little bit. So there's a kernel of knowledge, or a kernel of truth there. Um, so the suite of pests that you tackle in no-till um, is a little bit different. So these pests um, include black cutworm, uh, something called true armyworm, uh, stalk borer, and wireworm. Uh, the first three of these are caterpillars, uh, so larvae of moths. Uh, the wireworms are larvae of something called click beetles, and the wireworms like to feed on roots of various crops. But by far the worst pests that we run across are the most abundant pests or most commonly encountered pests are these guys here. And these are slugs. Um, that might not look like slugs to you, but those are slugs coating the front of a hay mower um, from a field that was harvested uh, in the evening in the spring of 2012 which was a bad slug year. There are a lot of slugs going around, and this particular grower down in the southern part of Pennsylvania was having a hard time with his hay production. He didn't understand why, and then it so happened that he harvested at night. And all these slugs coated the front of his uh, hay mower, and they were, of course, out and feeding because slugs are nocturnal. There's a picture of a close-up of a slug, um, and they're kind of attractive animals, if, um, if you can appreciate that for a moment. Um, but one thing I need to emphasize is that slugs aren't insects. Uh, if you've experienced high school biology or college biology, you, you may have learned that at one point, but I just want to emphasize it because it's not a, a, it's not a detail that a lot, a lot of people um, recognize right off the bat. So slugs are mollusks, and they're more closely related to snails and bivalves, you know, clams and mussels, that type of thing, than they are to insects. And the reason that's relevant so if you, is because if you want to kill a mollusk, you need to use a molluscicide, um, and they're not very susceptible to insecticides. Uh, and I'll come back to that point, so there's a little bit of a, a foreshadowing for you, for you uh, English majors. Um, and I'm going to focus on slugs uh, as a sort of case study, because slugs are difficult to control, and I feel if you can control slugs in no-till, then the other pests should be easier. So a little bit of background on slugs, in case you're not familiar with them. Um, you might have encountered them in your backyard, uh, gardens. They like to feed on hosta, lettuce, spinach, and the like. Um, but the best way to control slugs is with tillage. So as soon as you take tillage out, slugs are a little bit more comfortable, and their populations will grow if you have enough moisture. And in Pennsylvania and a lot of the mid-Atlantic, we have enough moisture. In Vermont, you can have enough moisture, I imagine, but tillage usually controls the population. When you stop tilling and start growing various crops, slugs can feed on most of them. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we're growing more and more canola, it seems, and slugs really enjoy canola. They like soybeans, uh, they like alfalfa and small grains, and they'll also feed upon corn. And importantly, they don't do very well on corn. It seems like the extensive damage they can cause to corn is a result of them feeding on a plant that they don't do very well on. So they actually have to eat more corn tissue to get the same amount of nutrients that they might get from a different plant species. There's been an estimate from the University of Delaware that about 20% of the no-till acreage in the mid-Atlantic suffers uh, yield losses from slug each from slugs each year. So that's about 600,000 acres. It's not a lot, but it certainly matters when it's your acreage or acreage that you are uh, working with. Here's a few images of what slug damage looks like. In the upper left-hand corner, you have a, a juvenile slug feeding upon a cotyledon of soybeans. Uh, the right-hand plant, the, solid, the cotyledons have already been removed, so that plant's not gonna grow any longer. So that's primarily how slugs damage soybeans, is they kill the plants before they get really, um, before they get started. The lower left-hand corner shows a soybean field, about a 30, 40 acre soybean field that has been cleared of plants. Slugs will do that for you. So in some cases you don't need herbicides, but the point here is to grow the crops, so that's not desirable. The lower right-hand corner is a bit hard to see because of the color contrast, but you can see that's kind of striping or um, stripping damage that is typical of slugs. They tend to feed uh, parallel to the leaf veins and just cause this shredding damage 
in the leaves. And in the upper right hand corner, you see typical slug damage in corn. It might be a low lying spot, uh, a spot with heavy residue. Uh, the slugs like to hang out underneath that residue and they'll, um, they'll feed away and what you'll get is kind of a, a spot that has very few plants in it. So um, it's clear that no-till decreases labor, helps conserve soil and moisture, um, uh, soil and uh, water resources, but it also provides great stability um, for natural enemies. So no-till fields are good habitat for natural enemies. So that same, uh, same lack of disturbance that helps build slug populations also helps build natural enemy populations. So things that like to eat slugs are more abundant in no-till fields. If you add cover crops to the mix, that will enhance natural enemy populations even further. But what we need to do as um, crop managers is to value those other things in the field. So I'm a strong believer that not every um, insect, uh, not every good insect is a dead insect or not every good um, insect is a, um, is a target of an insecticide application. There are many good insects in fields and those natural enemies um, play a strong role in managing the food web. So on this simplified food webs, of course, we'll ignore the, uh, the vertebrates for a moment. If you just think about the things that might be doing the eating, like ladybugs or predaceous beetles or dragonflies, the more of those predators we have around, the fewer pests we'll have feeding on crop plants. And in no-till fields with cover crops, we have more of these natural enemies around and they have a stronger potential to provide a pest control benefit. Of the community of animals that will develop in no-till fields, uh, ground beetles, as shown here, have been called lions of no-till fields because they really are the top predators in the vertebrate portion of the food chain. Certainly a vertebrate or a bird or a mouse could take out a ground beetle pretty quickly, but if we ignore those guys, these guys are playing a strong role in regulating uh, herbivorous insect populations. And some of these guys will also eat weed seeds, as Bill indicated. Ground beetles are valuable because both the larval stage, shown in the upper left, and the adult stage in the lower right uh, are predaceous. So the larvae will tunnel uh, through soil. Sometimes they'll come to the surface, but typically they just kind of tunnel through soils and anything that they encounter um, with those nice sharp mandibles they have, they will, they will try to eat and oftentimes they're successful. Uh, the adults are also predaceous, so you're getting pest control at both parts, uh, during both parts of their lives. And these guys can be fairly robust. Some of them are an inch long. Some are much smaller, but the biggest are about an inch long and um, really are voracious predators. They need to feed multiple times a day and they can do a great job if there's a kind of a robust population of them out in the field. And fortunately, these guys will eat all the things that tend to develop in no-till fields. So those include, again, uh, black cutworm, true armyworm, stock borer, wireworms and even slugs. So some ground beetles specialize on slugs. And if you can get good populations of those guys, um, then your slug populations tend to go down. I'm not sure this will play very well, but just to provide a little bit of um, visual to what a ground beetle will do, um, that ground beetle is attacking a corn earworm. And I will submit to you this is staged. This was not captured in the field. But if you have a couple thousand of these guys in a crop field, any caterpillar walking around the, on the ground is gonna be subject to this type of predation where it kind of gets ripped open by the ground beetle and then the ground beetle will start eating the guts of the caterpillar. Now there's not that many people that have love for corn earworm. Um, so if you don't have love for corn earworm, enjoy this um, misery that the beetle is imposing upon the caterpillar. Okay. So there are voracious predators, if given a chance, they'll eat most things smaller than them. And importantly, um, these predators can protect plants from pests. So um, the data shown in this figure have been collected over the um, past six years or so in a kind of long-term cropping system project that both Bill and I have been involved with. And the vertical axis here is kind of pest feeding damage to plants. And that really equates to both caterpillar and slug damage on plants. And the x-axis is predator population, just in terms of the abundance of insects we catch. So we, we quantify predator populations using what's called pitfall traps. We just put a cup in the ground and 
predators will bumble in there by accident, we'll go out there and count them. And we compare that to the amount of damage to plants nearby, we see a strong negative relationship. So as the predator population goes up, pest feeding damage to the adjacent plants comes down. And again, these data were collected over the past six years and they show um, a fairly strong relationship for field data. And it's encouraging to see that if we can grow a predator populations, we should be able to help um, use those guys to protect our plants. And again, a lot of these predators will feed on slugs. Um, not, a, not everyone will, but if, the, if you can grow the population as, um, as much as possible, then some percentage of those populations will be able to attack slugs, as well as the caterpillars and other things that are in the fields. All right, let's just take a brief diversion here into uh, mentioning something about insecticides. So insecticides uh, are valuable tools. I see great value in having insecticides around, but I don't see great value in using insecticides annually unless they're necessary. And historically, insecticides tend to be overused. And this is true whether we're talking about foliar applications of insecticides, soil applied insecticides, or just those insecticides that are coated on seeds, which are often called seed treatments or seed coatings. Uh, research over the years has shown pretty consistently that farmers tend to use insecticides when they don't need to. So that will actually put some production systems at a disadvantage, and I'll go into some details there uh, on that topic in a moment. But I see insecticides as tools that are there for the use. Using them blindly usually doesn't work out well, so I try to advocate for folks to use them more appropriately, um, and that means within an integrated pest management framework. So within an IPM framework, we need to scout, we need to look for insect pest populations in fields, and assess those populations, measure them somehow, and then determine if an insecticide application is necessary. Again, blindly putting insecticides out rarely works out well in terms of um, using inputs that aren't necessary or um, actually making pest populations worse. If we use insecticides um, inappropriately, there are unintended consequences that, uh, that mount. Uh, the first of which, which I'll emphasize a couple times today, or a couple more times, is that we decrease the number of good insects in the fields and that can make pest populations worse. I'll go into an example of that in a minute. Then there, of course, there are environmental concerns. A lot of the insecticides we use will get in waterways and then those waterways um, have um, simplified aquatic insect communities, for example, um, and that has repercussions throughout food webs. It can actually de decrease uh, insect feeding bird populations. It can decrease fish populations because there's not enough food around. That, uh, of course, is a concern that I bet we all share. And just to emphasize that these unintended consequences are the same, or more or less the same, for insecticides that are applied to leaves, that are applied to the soil, or coated on seeds. So in the research we've done, there's no real difference between these insecticides. There's a perception that insecticides coated on seeds have less um, kind of non-target effects, but our research is finding that not to be the case. So these seed treatments may be um, uh, just as bad or even worse in some ways as your typical pyrethroid or organophosphate sprays in terms of um, environmental consequences or disrupting good insect populations. And an example of that um, is here. So the next couple slides will go into this little story of how neonicotinoid seed treatments appear to exacerbate slug problems. So on this figure, um, on the vertical axis is number of slugs per trap. So to characterize uh, slug populations, we put um, one foot by one foot shingles into fields. These are actually white um, shingles that you might find on someone's house. But we use them as shelter traps. So we put them in the field and the slugs will gather underneath them and we just can go out and count them. And the x-axis is just the corn growing season. What you have here in the blue line are corn plots grown with untreated seeds. So these were seeds that did have not have an insecticide on them. While in the red uh, line shows um, slug populations where we had corn grown from a seed coated with an insecticide. And you can see on average over the growing season, we have more slugs where we have the insecticide that was coated on the seed compared to where we don't. And to provide a little more kind of research background here, I'll provide some detail on an experiment we did a couple of years ago now, but that remains relevant today. 
And this was a straightforward experiment with the two treatments. We either had treated soybean seeds or untreated soybean seeds. The untreated plots are re represented by black here. And in, uh, in red are the treated seeds, where we had soybean seeds that were treated with thymethoxum, which is the active ingredient in a product called Cruiser. And we had also had fungicides on those seeds. So those insectic that insecticide thymethoxum plus these fungicides equate to a product called Cruiser Max. Okay, and each of these um, two treatments had six uh, plots out there. They are quarter acre plots, and we planted these soybeans on 30 inch rows. And I'll just walk you through four figures to emphasize the data that we collected. And I want to emphasize that these are, uh, this was a field experiment done in central Pennsylvania at our, at our research farm in 2012, which again was a pretty good slug year. There were a lot of slugs around that year. And one thing I want to emphasize for all four figures is you'll see how tight the, the, uh, the data points are to the regression line. Again, this is a field experiment, yet we have a very strong pattern that emerges in the field. So the first figure shows on the y-axis yield and the x-axis number of soybean plants per acre. Not surprisingly, as you increase the number of soybean plants per acre, yield increases. That makes perfect sense. But look at the color of the points. Uh, where we have the black dots, that's where we grew these soybeans with the insecticides on the seed. But on average, where you have the insecticide on the seed, you have fewer soybean plants per acre and lower yield. Next figure shows soybean plants per acre, uh, this time on the vertical axis, the number of slugs per trap on the horizontal axis. You can see here, as the number of slugs per trap increased, the number of soybean plants per acre um, decreased, and of course, then that means the yield would come down. But again, the color of the dots matters. Where we had insecticides coated on the seed, we had uh, more slugs per trap, fewer plants per acre, thus lower yield. The next two figures will bring the predators into play because, as I've told you, um, predators can help control slug populations, and this just kind of illustrates that. On the vertical axis here, we have predation. While on the x-axis, we have slug predators per trap. Again, to count slug predators in fields, we use what we call these pitfall traps. It's just, again, a cup sunk into the ground, and predators will bumble in there, and we'll go out and count them. The vertical axis here is predation. We quantify predation by taking a caterpillar, putting a pin through the tail end of the caterpillar, and then pinning that caterpillar to the ground. And then um, natural enemies like these beetles will come around and eat them. So we check these caterpillars periodically just to characterize how many have been eaten. Essentially, we're quantifying predation. So the bigger the number, the better here. In a perfect world, we would do this type of experiment with slugs, but slugs do not uh, are not insects, so they don't have an exoskeleton. So if we put a pin through a slug and put the pin into the ground, the slug will actually pull itself off the pin and won't be there when we come back, and that will have nothing to do with predation. So just to uh, acknowledge that this is uh, an insect being eaten by predators, not a slug. But anyway, as we increase, as, sorry, as, I, as the number of slug predators in our traps increases, predation uh, goes up. Um, but again, importantly, the dot um, color matters. So on average, where we have more um, slug predators and where we have more predation, we don't have the insecticide in the mix. So when we have the insecticide in the mix, we have fewer slug predators and less predation. This figure ties the predation to slugs, just emphasizing that this assay we use with caterpillars pinned has relevance for slug population. So here, predation is on the x-axis. Again, the larger the number, the better. And the uh, number of slugs per trap is on the vertical axis. As predation increased on these caterpillars, the number of slugs per trap comes down, uh, indicating that some of the predators that are, that are responsible for removing these caterpillars are also influencing uh, the slug populations. But again, the color of the dots here matters. So on average, where we have no insecticide on the, coated on the seeds, we have higher predation and fewer slugs per trap. So what this all indicates is that these insecticides are disrupting biological control. Even though they're coated on the seed, they're still influencing the system. Uh, and we've done uh, 
enough research in this system to know that these insecticides are getting um, taken up by the slugs as they feed upon these soybean plants. But because they're mollusks and not insects, they're not susceptible to those insecticides. The insecticide is in their system. And then when one of these ground beetles comes around to attack it and bites it, they get a dose of the insecticide. Some of this dosing will kill the ground beetles. Some of this dosing will just um, uh, knock them out for a little while and they'll actually recover. Um, but the tendency is, is that when you have these insecticides in the system, the predator population is smaller and there's not as much potential for pest control. Interestingly, or, and notably, a very similar study came out in 2017 from an Australian research group that studied very much the same thing, but they just studied the broadcast application of insecticide and its influence on slug populations. And they found more or less the same thing, that where you're broadcasting insecticides, slug populations tend to be worse. That broadcast application of the insecticide is having a direct effect on predator populations, and that allows slugs populations to grow kind of unchecked. So my conclusion is that when insecticides in the system are in the system, it just makes slugs more, diff more difficult to control because there aren't as many predators around. And this is true whether it's an insecticide coated on a seed or an insecticide sprayed across an entire field. So uh, when I talk to farmers on the um, extension trail, um, I encourage them to manage for the pests that they have. So if slugs are your main concern, and in many fields in Pennsylvania, slugs are more concerning than, um, than insects, then don't use an insecticide unless you really have to. If you need an insecticide, use it within that IPM framework. Scout the insects that you're concerned about. If their populations are big enough to require an insecticide application, then fine, go and do so. But blindly using an insecticide, whether it's a seed treatment or including an insecticide, in the herbicide application or the um, pre or post um, herbicide application doesn't matter to me. Um, if you're including insecticide just because you can, you're probably um, short, circuit, short circuiting the system somehow by decreasing the number of natural enemies out there. And there's um, further examples in the um, scientific literature of, of, of natural enemies providing good levels of pest control. Here's an example um, that came from the University of Delaware um, that showed that stability and diversity in the cropping system gives predator a chance to be more effective. In a study that was done a couple of years ago now, they had a six year study that studied four different rotations, either continuous corn rotation that used preventative insecticides. So they were putting insecticides out regardless of whether pests were present or not, they were just doing it to try to prevent any problems. There's a corn, corn soy rotation, there's a corn soy wheat rotation, and there's a corn soy wheat rotation with cover crops that used IPM. So in this last um, example, they were, they were scouting and only putting insecticide out if insect populations exceeded economic thresholds. And surprising to some is the fact that the worst pest populations were in this continuous corn that used preventative insecticides. Again, Folks are trying to use those preventive insecticides to prevent a problem, but it often isn't effective. And this study showed that the pest populations were worse where preventive insecticides were being used, and the pest populations were best controlled by a diverse rotation with cover crops that incorporated IPM. Uh, at Penn State, we have a similar kind of long-term cropping systems project underway. Um, uh, and Bill has been associated with this project for a while. Um, it's led by an agronomist named Heather Karsten, and in this study we're comparing a two-year corn-soybean rotation that has no cover crops to two more diverse rotations that are six-year uh, efforts, and they include cover crops. Um, one of them includes alfalfa. There's also small grains in there, and the goal is to figure out which of these rotations is kind of best for, for a dairy um, to produce all the feed and forage that it needs. From a pest management perspective, these two rotations are different because one is relying on preventative, um, a preventative approach to insect control, and the other one's just relying on IPM. So that simplified corn soybean rotation is using BT corn, uh, whether it's corn or soy, there are seed treatments there. And also shortly after planting, we're putting a broadcast pyrethroid application on because many farmers do that. 
And again, the two six-year rotations are just using uh, IPM. So we're scouting these fields. If we find insect pest populations above the economic threshold, we'll use an insecticide. Otherwise, we do not. And just like the previous study from the University of Delaware, the pest populations have been worse in this two-year corn-soy rotation that's using these preventative treatments. So the preventative treatments don't always prevent what you want them to prevent. Sometimes they prevent the natural enemy populations from growing, and that um, will allow the pest populations to grow. So uh, a final word about all this before I go into a specific example. So insecticides can disrupt natural control. Um, I ask farmers to scrutinize and try to optimize their insecticide usage, and they should apply this thinking to soil of applied insecticides. Insecticides are broadcasting across an entire field, which are often called uh, foliar applications of insecticides. And then also their seed treatments. Again, seed treatments are often thought to be this innocuous um, small dose um, that is needed to grow crops. Um, in Pennsylvania, we haven't found that to be the case. And in fact, with this example with slugs, we find that the seed treatments are disruptive. So I encourage farmers to use integrated pest management as much as possible because it protects those allies in pest control. So integrated pest management is basically scouting fields, quantifying populations of insect pests that are encountered, applying economic thresholds, and there are a lot of economic thresholds that have been published and they're easily found online, or looking at something like the Penn State Agronomy Guide. Um, if they're not available, then you can contact um, specialists and, and we can give you a sense of what the economic threshold is. Um, and then the bottom line is just use the insecticide only when necessary, only when it makes economic sense. And that's what economic thresholds kind of uh, define. So we're trying to avoid disruption of that are living in those fields. Okay, and then I'll just move quickly to a, um, a little case study of one gentleman here in Pennsylvania who's implementing uh, IPM and a diverse rotation and cover crops to manage his slug populations. And this is Lucas Criswell. He's there on the, on the left in the blue shirt. And that's his father uh, on the right. And Lucas took over the farm a couple years ago from his dad and he's doing things a whole lot differently and it makes his father uncomfortable at times, but Lucas has been having some good success. So I started to interact with Lucas back in 2009. Um, and he was having uh, some trouble, troubles with his small grains that slugs were eating um, every plant that was coming up. And as we stood in one of his fields watching the slugs, uh, or the, the, uh, watching the effect of the slugs and trying to understand what was going on, he made a simple comment to me, and that was that if there's a slug in this field and he wants to eat a green plant, the only thing that it can feed upon is the cash crop itself, because Lucas is pretty good with his weed control. So we asked a simple question, can we provide slugs something else that will distract them from the cash crop? And I, of course, said I had no idea, but I'm willing to um, work on that. So we did a little bit of research, um, both at Lucas's farm and then also at the Penn State Research Farm. This picture is from the Penn State Research Farm, and it shows cereal rye planted between the rows of soybeans. We did this experiment in both corn and in soy, but this, of course, is just showing, showing soy. This figure uh, right in the middle of the screen, you can see soybean plants that are alternating, um, soybean rows that are alternating with cereal rye. So you can see soy, cereal rye, soy, cereal rye, soy, cereal rye. And this was established in the spring. We of course had the soybean in the planter boxes, but the cereal rye we put in the fertilizer box of our no-till planter. So we established this with one pass. Off on the left or off on the right, you can see uh, two plots that have a little bit more uh, ground showing, and those are plots that are just soybeans with nothing between the rows. And then these type of plots, both at Lucas's farm and on our research farm, we tracked damage to uh, the plants, and we also tracked natural enemy populations. This figure shows slug ratings on the, uh, on the y-axis, uh, the vertical axis, and we do that on a zero to four scale. So a, a plant that receives a rating of zero has had no slug damage, whereas a plant that received a rating of four is nearly dead from slug feeding. And then on the x-axis, we have plants that um, were in plots where there's no rye between the row or there was rye between the row. And what you can see from our results here is that when we had rye between the rows, there was significantly less slug damage to those soybean plants or corn plants. It was the same for both crops 
um, than when we had no rye between the rows. So when there was something else to feed upon, the slugs um, were at least distracted by the rye and may well have preferred to feed upon the rye. Then in the same types of plots, um, where we had no rye or rye, uh, we also captured uh, natural enemies. And these are just the number of ground beetles in our pitfall traps. So you can see the number of ground beetles is almost three times um, as much when we have rye between the rows. So ground beetles like a little bit more of a diverse planting, and they'll be more abundant if there are more plant species around. So just by increasing um, the plant diversity here by one plant species, we triple the number of ground beetles per plot. And so I took this information back to Lucas, and then he went crazy. Um, of course, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to establish a cover crop in the spring, as we did in our experiments, but Lucas simply adopted his um, cover crop use to make uh, a very similar scenario. So in this first effort, uh, he shared this picture with me. What he did is he established his cereal rye in the fall, and he closed up every two rows of his drill so that there would be a gap into which he could plant in the spring. So this is the picture of him planting in the spring into those gaps that he left when he planted the cover crop in the fall. Right? So this is a more proper use of a cover crop established in the fall, and he plants into it in the spring into these gaps. And this worked so well the first year. Um, and he had uh, nice results. He had very little slug damage, and he had high yields. So he went a little bit crazy, and he started planting into standing rye. So this is the planting green that uh, Bill mentioned. This is his kind of second version of doing this. Um, he did not uh, do anything to the rye, um, but then he planted into it. Then one to seven days afterwards, he would come back and hit it with glyphosate and it would slowly die. The benefits that Lucas sees in doing this is that the soil is, over, is, is always covered. The fields where he's doing this, he's greatly increasing the organic content and he has higher biodiversity but he recognizes that he needs to commit to IPM. So he has a scout check these fields every 10 to 14 days to make sure there are any pest populations developing unexpectedly. And then the third version of Lucas's planting green involves getting some specialized equipment. So he um, got these rollers mounted on the front of his, uh, his corn planter. So we're standing in front of the corn planter. So if it was running, we would be run over by it. But you can see, um, the opening wheels, and then the rollers, and behind that, the seed is placed. And when Lucas runs this, this is what it looks like. This is very similar to the video that Bill shared. Um, and it provides some clear benefits. So you get the, the seed placed between these rows of thatch, and those thatch provide um, a couple types of services. One, they're providing nice habitat for natural enemies. Two, it's providing an alternative food source for slugs. So our slugs will actually prefer to feed on that dying glyphosate killed rye than they will on a corn or soybean plants. Some of our lab research has shown that. And then this is providing nice weed control for the, uh, for the plants that Bill was talking about. If you have that type of thatch, it's going to be difficult for a lot of weeds to get through that and have a productive life. There are certainly growers in Pennsylvania that are planting green and not rolling like this. Uh, but the benefits that Lucas sees to rolling include, and they're listed in the upper right-hand corner, you get more uniform cover, you get actually get better planting, so you have better seed placement, and that biomass persists longer and provides that weed control benefit. That's what it looks like up close. You can see the nice seed furrow there, um, and then the, um, the thatch off to the sides. Uh, in a more current version of what Lucas is doing now, he tells me you cannot see any soil. So he's refined this to a way where a raindrop that falls on a planted green field cannot hit soil, or it's very unlikely it'll hit soil. Um, and this earlier version um, is imperfect because the soil is exposed. And he's done some work with this. He's, uh, he's a curious guy by nature, and he'll do uh, research on his own farm. And he's done a couple side by sides where he has a, a fully treated. Uh, Acre Max, which is a fancy variety of corn, comparing that to an untreated, untraded kind of conventional variety of corn, he can get equivalent yields uh, by planting green um, because the predators are providing that pest control and the pest populations aren't that high. Yet he sees a savings of about $9,000 per year because he doesn't need as much herbicide, he doesn't need the insecticide um, unless a pest population shows. <clears throat> 
And here's just one last picture. Um, the figure on the right shows that thatch persisting well into August, while on the left where he didn't roll, there's no thatch and weeds would be free to come up there. And still well into August, that thatch on the right will provide natural enemy habitat in addition to the weed suppression. So you're providing more than one benefit by, by rolling the crop down. All right, so just to wrap up here, um, it's clear that more diverse rotations have fewer pest problems, including fewer slugs. So if folks are gonna go into no-till, um, I would encourage them to get diverse as possible, including cover crops. Um, a lot of folks will even tie valuing soil health to that because these are all soil health building properties. But the key point I wanna emphasize is that these soil health building um, practices will help build natural only populations. If you're gonna to try to build natural only populations, then of course you need to scrutinize your insecticide use. Um, and that includes soil applied insecticides, broadcast insecticides, including foliars. Um, and then seed treatments, because you don't want to counteract the natural enemies you're building with these nice practices by just blasting them with insecticides. And then use, um, use these insecticides only when the pest populations are big enough. And to determine if they're big enough, the IPM needs to be the basis. So commit to scouting, commit to applying um, economic thresholds after the scouting has quantified the pest populations that are in the field, and then use insecticides only when it makes economic sense. Okay, I think that's all I have here. One last picture of, a, of a, an assassin bug or a wheel bug eating a Japanese beetle, and I'll uh, answer any questions. So, Catherine, back to you. Thanks again for participating, and we hope you have a great week.